In this lecture, we're going to talk about the topic of cooperative breeding. Cooperative breeding is a system of breeding characterized by the normal presence of helpers at some or all nests. So, this begs the question, what is a helper? Helpers are individuals that perform parent-like behavior, which is sometimes referred to as alloparental care, towards young that are not its own offspring. So, these individuals are, are acting like parents, but they're not providing this behavior towards their own offspring. And that's why it's called alloparental care. Allo means other. So these are the issues we want to discuss associated with cooperative breeding. We're going to find out that typically the individuals that are helpers are delaying dispersal. and We want to understand why they're doing this. And in certain circumstances, we're going to address the question of even though they may delay dispersal, do the helpers still have breeding opportunities or do they just serve in their helper role? And even if they are delaying dispersal, why do they even help? Remember, we talked about the cost of parental care. Parental care can be very costly. And so why would these individuals provide alloparental care? What are they getting out of it? And then finally, we're going to address the question, do the helpers really do any good? Do they actually help? So let's address the first question, why delay dispersal? Most hypotheses that have addressed this question have, have taken an ecological constraints point of view. There's something about the ecology of the organisms that are constraining individuals from being able to disperse successfully at a young age. The first model that examined this is called the habitat saturation model. And it basically assumes that all of the suitable breeding habitat slots are filled. Young birds basically are forced to delay dispersal. So here we see an individual that is born to a male and female in one breeding season. In the next breeding season, it's time to disperse, and this individual checks to see if there are any territories open. There aren't any territories open, so they just this individual ends up staying in its natal territory. But people began questioning the utility of this model. Why not just disperse in marginal habitats as floaters? This is what typically happens in territorial species. Individuals that are unable to get a successful territory basically just exist as floaters until a territory opens up. Why are they staying in their natal territory? Well, that led to the development of the marginal habitat model, which builds on the idea of the habitat saturation model, but adds an additional constraint that the lack of habitats of marginal quality exist in some species and therefore these individuals don't have the potential to exist as non-breeding floaters. So again we have an example here where a bird again is in its natal territory it begins the breeding season looking for a, a territory opening or some marginal habitat to exist in as a floater there are no territory openings and there are no mar marginal habitats. And a species that seems to fit this model fairly well are Florida scrub jays. Florida scrub jays live in this very specialized oak scrub habitat that has to be burned at a very frequent basis and the territories are either suitable for breeding or they're just not suitable for even surviving in. And so that, that fits the idea that there are no marginal habitats here. There's a more complex model that in some cases appears to be a more reasonable model to, to fit the typical situation seen in some cooperative breeding species. This is called the benefits of Philopatry model. And it focuses on a situation where in a population there's a lot of variation in the quality of breeding territories. And whether an individual will delay dispersal or not really de is dependent on what the quality of the habitat that they were born into. So individuals born into high quality natal territories might be better served to remain at home despite the availability of lower quality territories that they could disperse in and attempt to breed. So here we see an individual in this green territory again born into this natal territory. The green may represent a very high quality territory. Once it is one year old it is capable of reproduction and it tries to disperse checking out different territories finding that there are no green territories, high quality territories available. There are some lower quality territories available for immediate breeding, but this individual might 
go ahead and delay dispersal, remain in its natal territory. Well, why would it do this? Well, this is why the model is called the benefits of filipatry hypothesis or model. It's basically built on the idea that filipatry, staying at home, which filipatry means love of, of country or love of land, there are benefits to that in certain circumstances. Staying in a good quality territory, your natal territory, may allow you eventually, maybe in the next year, to inherit that natal territory. This may be your best eventual route to gaining a breeding territory that is of high quality. Or if territories are dispersed in such a way that high quality territories seem to be kind of in a neighborhood of other high quality uh, territories, you might be better staying off in your natal territory so you can keep an eye on the nearby territories of equal quality so that if something opens up, you might be able to be the first individual in there to try to establish that as your territory. Now, your other option in this situation was to disperse into these lower quality territories, but there may be a cost associated with that. You may, by staying in your natal territory, you may be avoiding the increased mortality associated with trying to live in these lower quality habitats. Now let's look at it from the perspective of individuals born on low quality habitats. They may be better served by immediate dispersal. I mean, obviously these individuals, like this individual here, once it's attempting to breed, it's going to go check out the green territories and see if any of those are open. In many cases those will not be available. Those will be saturated. And so this individual will decide to go ahead and disperse into a lower quality territory. And that makes sense because this individual has nothing really to gain by delaying dispersal in a low quality territory. Yes, you might be able to inherit this territory, but you could breed immediately in a lower quality territory. Those are available. So individuals that are occasionally born into these lower quality territories, they might as well just go ahead and try to uh, breed in these lower quality territories that are available if they can't wedge themselves into one of the higher quality territories. The benefits of filipatry hypothesis was basically built with an understanding of acorn woodpeckers. Acorn woodpecker territory value is really determined by granary trees. These are pictures of some woodpeckers in their granary trees. They drill individual holes where they stuff individual acorns that they're basically using as a pantry for feeding throughout the year. And the more uh, granary trees and the larger the granary tree, the higher quality that habitat. And this influences dispersal decisions of young birds. Now there may be other reasons why individuals would delay dispersal. Maybe they're just not sexually mature. So there could be some endocrine-based reasons associated with this. Males with low testosterone don't have the behaviors to establish and defend territories. They may not have testosterone levels high enough to actually produce sperm. Females that are unable to demonstrate the ability to reproduce, maybe because of other lower uh, hormone levels, may be rejected by territorial males. And again, their best bet may be to just delay dispersal in those circumstances. Now, in species in which young birds uh, are not capable of, of reproduction and are staying in these natal territories in larger social groups, oftentimes they want to signal their non-reproductive status to, to lower the potential aggressive behavior that could be associated with a, a perceived threat of challenging the dominant birds. And so the bird here on the left is a juvenile Mexican jay. The juveniles have these pinkish uh, basal parts of their bill as opposed to an adult seen here on the right that has a fully black bill. Another reason why you might not disperse is addressed by the skills hypothesis. Individuals must first learn the necessary skills to be able to successfully disperse and attempt successful breeding. And this might be particularly true in species living in harsh, uh, extremely unpredictable, variable environments. So staying at home, delaying dispersal until you can build up these skills might be the best thing in the long run. And a species that uh, seems to fit at least partially this idea are the white wing chuffs of Australia. Another potential limitation to be able to disperse and breed early is a sex ratio bias. 
in some species of cooperative breeders, there appears to be an excess of males in the population. And so there are just limitations to your ability to disperse and recruit a female, even if territories are available. So given that you're limited in your ability to breed independently, there might be benefits to staying at home. And we'll address this when we talk about uh, some of the potential benefits of the helping behavior itself. And one species that fits this pattern is uh, seen here in East Texas, one of the species that my students and I have been studying, the brown-headed nuthatch. Far more males in the population than females. Well, let's get to the second question now. Do the helpers sometimes breed? Why not breed on the territory where you're serving as a helper? Well, in some cases, helper individuals might breed. They may try to get extra pair copulations with individuals in neighboring territories, or they may, from the female's perspective, may try to slip eggs into the nests of neighboring territories, uh, which would be an example of intraspecific brood parasitism. And in some cases, the helpers are unrelated to at least one individual in the pair that they're helping. And this might give them the potential to mate with the main breeders in this situation. This is a bit controversial in the literature. I take the position that in this case, these individuals are not really helpers because they, if they're breeding with the breeder, the young that they're helping to take care of, well, they could be their young. And so that explains why they're doing this behavior. It's no longer necessarily alloparental care. It's just parental care. Others would still consider this an example of these birds potentially being helpers. Let's look at an example of how it can get really complex and helpers serving in different roles. Pied kingfishers are seen in Asia and Africa. The primary helpers are helping due to the potential gains that they can get in indirect fitness. So kin selection has led to this behavior in this species they are able to uh, bring more food to the nest and that increases the production of closely related individuals because they're typically helping mom and dad. In some cases, secondary helpers are seen at some nests. These individuals are males that are unrelated to the breeders. And the secondary helpers are helping not for kin selection reasons, since they're unrelated to the breeders, but they're trying to form a, a bond with the breeding female in case the breeding male dies in the next year, they have a greater shot of being the next male breeder at that nest. So in this situation, again, I wouldn't consider these individuals as true helpers. If, they're, if they do attempt to mate with a female, they're providing this care to offspring that may actually be theirs. Now, why would the male allow the secondary helpers into their social group? Well, secondary helpers are only allowed in times of extreme low food availability. This has been studied in Africa, and from a kingfisher's point of view, bad conditions are when lake levels are really high. That reduces the density of fish and makes it harder for the kingfishers to find fish quickly, and these are the conditions when secondary helpers are allowed to bring food to the nest. So as you can see here, if you look at the fish d delivered to the individuals at a nest, the male and the female breeder, these are the parents. They're doing a lot of work, being good parents. The primary helper is trying to increase the production of brothers and sisters so that they can gain indirect fitness, and so they're doing a lot of work. The secondary helpers are bringing just enough food so that they are providing at least some service so that they're not run off by the breeding male. The breeding male allows them to stay in the area, but they're not really working that hard. And as you can see from the figure here, looking at the reproductive success of individuals in these two helper categories and comparing it to individuals that may just delay and do nothing in their first year of life, the primary helpers, the ones that are related, if you look in their first year of reproductive success, why is the extra young that their helping behavior helps to produce? And so they do uh, produce 1.8 on average extra young, and their average relatedness, because sometimes they may only be helping uh, mom or just helping dad, uh, but the average relatedness in the population the helpers are helping uh, is 0.32, these extra offspring they're helping to produce. 
So their fitness in that first year is 0.58 fitness units. Now compare that to secondary helpers. Their help does increase the reproductive success of the pair that they help, uh, 1.3. But since they're not related to these individuals, they don't get anything out of it that first year. And delayers obviously aren't doing anything, and so there's no fitness associated with that. But let's look at how this translates into fitness in the second year. All of these individuals in these three classes uh, do gain, just assuming the average number of offspring, 2.5, and they're related to their offspring by 0.5. Let's look at how there can be variation in other variables. S stands for the probability of surviving into the second year. And you see that the hard work that the primary helpers put into it actually reduces their chance of surviving into the next year. They only about have about a 50% chance of surviving the next year compared to the secondary helpers and the delayers, which really aren't doing that much. So they have actually increased survivorship. If you look at M, M is the probability of finding a mate in the second year. Again, the primary helpers have a relatively reduced chance of finding a mate compared to the secondary helpers. The secondary helpers oftentimes do convince the breeding female in the nest that they were helping to breed with them in the next year, so that increases their chance of reproduction. The delayers actually have the lowest chance of mating because they don't uh, have the skills and may not be able to convince uh, females to uh, mate. And so if you look at the uh, fitness, total fitness associated with all these parameters, you see that in the second year, the secondary helper has the highest fitness, and the primary helper has relatively low fitness, but again, that's just in the second year. If you combine the first year of their fitness and the second year of fitness that they have, it is comparable and just slightly higher than the secondary helper. Delayers are pretty rare in this population and you can see why. They have relatively low fitness in these two years. In, in some cases, in some species, helpers may not be sexually uh, capable. Helpers may be sexually immature. But in other species, the breeders may be threatened by an unrelated helper being around. And that is the case with the pied kingfisher. In this situation, the breeders can help prevent the helpers from becoming as big of a reproductive threat by basically picking on them. High degrees of aggression leads to reproductive inhibition. Um, it raises stress hormones like corticosterone, which has a negative impact on the production of t testosterone, which could lower the ability for these individuals to produce functional sperm. And Yuri Rayer, the biologist that studied cooperative breeding in pied kingfishers, called this mechanism psychological castration. Okay, so we've addressed the idea that individuals may delay dispersal. They may have some limited capability of breeding, but if, if they do, then really probably you shouldn't even be referring to them as helpers. But these individuals that are delaying dispersal why don't they just kick back and use the resources associated with the natal territory? Why are they providing alloparental care? Well, one idea is that helping may be a payment of rent. It's basically they're paying for the use of the high quality territory and that they're doing that because they want to stay in this high quality territory. They can use the resources, it may be a safer area, and so by staying in their natal territory it may increase their chance of surviving into the next year. Another idea that helping may increase the survivorship until breeding possible is in addition to just using the resources and being in a safer area, if you help to raise more individuals, you're raising a larger group. And we've talked throughout the semester about some benefits of being in a larger group as it relates to avoiding predation. So dilution effect, an earlier detection, of more efficient detection of predators and so forth. Another reason why helpers might help is by helping you're developing the critical specialized skills needed to eventually become a good parent. So this will increase your chance of successful breeding in the future. What about the increased chance of, of just breeding itself? Could you possibly inherit the territory if you're a good helper? This is seen in, in some species. When you help to raise extra young, you're helping to produce a larger group this larger group may be able to outcompete neighboring groups for territorial space. And in that situation, the oldest helper 
may then butt off a section of an enlarged breeding territory. Kind of work you through that. Here we have two neighboring territories. One group has helpers, the other one doesn't. That leads to this takeover of one group into the other to make this big super territory. And then the oldest helper basically then says, okay, thanks guys, I got it from here. I'm going to start defending this boundary against my parents now and my, my natal group. And it l ends up forming two neighboring territories of family members. And so this getting a group of, of young to help you take over the neighboring territory increases your chance of eventually getting a breeding territory. Kind of in a related way, helpers may sometimes just form coalitions with their younger individuals to assist uh, uh, in fighting for breeding vacancies, not necessarily just with the neighboring territory so that you can butt it, but they may basically form roving gangs that will allow you to then take over a territory. And then finally, in some cases, forming social bonds with the opposite sex breeder in the group, if it's an unrelated individual, may allow you to become the breeder in the future. But again, if they do breed, then really we shouldn't consider these helpers, and this is just an alternative way of gaining a breeding role, but it's not through helping. The picture here is a green whitapoo. The green whitapoos are an example of the first example on this slide where they, the older helpers will help raise brothers and sisters to form a gang to help take over a territory in the area. And finally, one of the biggest potential advantages of helping is helping may increase the production of non-descendant kin. And this gets us back into talking about kin selection and Hamilton's rule. Individuals may be able to increase their indirect route of fitness to maximize their inclusive fitness if they're close related to the breeders and they can significantly increase the fitness of the breeders. Remember this was set up by Hamilton's rule. So for an example here, if the typical male and female population can produce two offspring but an individual forgoes reproduction to help mom and dad and serve as a helper and they can double the reproductive success of their parents. These two individuals, they can't count because that's what their parents could have done anyway, but these other two individuals, these full siblings, are genetic equivalents to the offspring that they would have been able to produce if they could get the population average if they bred. And so this would be kind of the break-even point. There may be, however, non-adaptive explanations for helping behavior. Remember, there may be ecological limitations to successful dispersal. Individuals are kind of hanging around their natal territory for certain reasons, benefits of filipatry, for example, or habitat saturation, lack of marginal habitats. And when you're hanging around the natal territory, mom and dad are breeding, and you hear baby birds begging this begging may stimulate these helpers to deliver alloparental care. Alloparental care may be a non-adaptive consequence of just extreme selection in birds to be very good parents. So why wouldn't you have selection to prevent helping behavior? Well, individuals who do avoid allo feeding might also be less likely to provide good parental care behavior in the future. If you have selection to withhold parental care, you may not be able to do so in a way that only restricts that care when you're not feeding your own offspring. It may be more like an on-off switch in birds. And so when you hear baby birds singing, in most situations, those are going to be your young. And so there's been extreme selection pressure to feed those young. And we've talked about some extreme examples of parental care that fit this pattern. We talked about the situation in the host of European cuckoos, like the great reed warbler, where there's extreme selection pressure to try to get rid of parasitic eggs then. But once they hatch and the baby birds start begging, it turns the parents basically into little feeding robots. Another extreme example of that has been seen in several cases of birds feeding ornamental fish. Ornamental fish come to the surface showing red gapes, which appears to stimulate some birds into feeding them. Again, just more evidence that in some cases birds may just be little hormonally driven parental robots given certain visual stimuli.
Now let's address the question, do helpers really help? Helpers can increase the production of offspring, and they can do this by increasing the amount or the more uh, consistent supply of food to the young, which could reduce starvation, increase the weight of the young when fledged, and that is a significant predictor of young survival. This has been demonstrated in white-fronted bee eaters, and white-fronted bee eaters, the more helpers you have, the more consistent food is delivered to the young, and it significantly reduces starvation and increases the number of young fledged at each nest. In other species of bee eaters, one of the species that I studied, the little green bee eater in Thailand, the helper role appears to be more important in helping to guard the nest against lizard and snake predators. They basically can rally troops to mob these predators and nests that have helpers have reduced predation rates. Florida scrub jays live in these very saturated, very specialized habitats where there are no marginal habitats. They're a long-lived species, so that kind of leads to this buildup of potential breeders and helpers. And helpers, one of the biggest roles that they provide is increased protection from predators like snakes. Now one question that's brought up in some cases of helping and cooperative breeding are, are those territories that have helpers simply doing better because they're on better quality territories? Or is it that they have helpers and the helpers are providing some vital service? So Ron Mummy did an experiment with scrub jays in which he removed helpers from certain experimental territories and showed that it these territories didn't have helpers just because they were really high quality territories and therefore there was kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy to produce more and more young. If you remove the helpers in three different years, you see that they have much lower number of offspring produced than the control groups that just weren't messed with. So helpers may actually help raise extra young at each nest. But there's some other ways that helpers may provide some less obvious advantages. For example, helpers may allow the breeders to attempt more clutches each year, lay more clutches of eggs in more nests, by reducing the breeder's responsibility to the previous clutch. Helpers may also increase the lifespan and lifetime reproductive success of the breeders. This has been seen in Florida scrub jays and pied kingfishers. And finally, I don't want to give the impression that cooperative breeding is seen only in birds. I happen to know that best because this is one of the areas of research that I've uh, worked in uh, with birds. But some insects also show cooperative breeding behavior. And in these insects, it's referred to as subsocial or primitively eusocial systems. And a classic example of that is paper wasps. Paper wasps, the individuals emerge in the fall and mate. In the wintertime, the females will hibernate in crevices and then emerge in the spring to build their paper nest. And during this phase, sisters oftentimes join forces to work together to build these initial paper nests with the individual cells. But it, there's a very quickly a dominant hierarchy established where one of the sisters becomes dominant. All of the females care for the young. The subordinates, however, lay many fewer or no eggs, and the dominant individual gets much more reproductive success out of this. The first broods in these cases just produce female workers or individuals, again, that are going to be subordinate and have little to no reproductive success. Their job, jobs are to increase the nest size, care for the eggs, guard the nest. And so most of these have very little direct fitness. And some have absolutely no direct fitness. But the later broods are going to produce reproductives which are going to then fly off and mate when mature. And so if the colony produces more reproductives due to the help of subordinate sisters, these subordinate sisters are not getting anything out of it directly, but indirectly they're helping to produce extra reproductives which are closely related to them, and so they're gaining inclusive fitness via the indirect route of fitness. And how do they actually help? Well, nests with more workers suffer much less nest predation, and uh, are more efficient at producing more reproductives. They build a larger nest and are able to help their dominant sister lay more eggs. So again, workers end up getting inclusive fitness via the indirect fitness component. So in review, we talked about definitions of cooperative breeding, system of breeding that encompasses the uh, helpers, and helpers are individuals that are providing alloparental care. 
One of the first questions we addressed was why do individuals delay dispersal in these systems? A lot of the potential explanations for this are, are based on uh, habitat limitations, the habitat saturation model, the marginal habitat model, and the benefits of filipatry model. And these models build in more and more complexity and probably more realistic situations going from top to bottom here. Another reason why individuals might delay dispersal is due to immature developmental stages. They don't have the hormone levels to successfully reproduce, or perhaps they don't have the skills to reproduce. And finally, they may not disperse because there's no reason to. If there's a male biased population, males could disperse and defend a territory, but there are no females to recruit, and there might be other reasons to stay at home and delay dispersal. We talked about the fact that helpers may sometimes breed. However, if they're doing this through extra pair copulation with unrelated breeders in the social unit, they're really not helpers in that situation. And breeders oftentimes will try to prevent unrelated helpers from breeding with their mate and gaining these extra pair copulations by abusing them, and this has been called psychological castration. But true helpers still could be breeding if they get extra pair copulation or intraspecific brood parasitism associated with neighboring groups. And they may actually be true helpers at the, their natal territory helping mom and dad raise their brothers and sisters. So why help? Well, helping may be a way to pay rent so that you can remain on the natal territory and you might want to do that uh, because you are able to use high quality resources. There may be safety associated with that. And in each case, this could lead to increased chance of survival until you really can disperse and breed. Or it may increase your chance of future breeding through inheritance of the territory, budding and getting your own territory that way, or takeover of neighboring territories by helping to produce a gang of individuals. While you're helping, you may be gaining skills so that when you do get a territory, you're a more efficient parent. And immediately you may get some inclusive benefits by increasing the production of closely related individuals. So this is a way you could gain via kin selection. And finally, we talked about the potential that in some species, cooperative breeding may be explained simply because of delayed dispersal, and the helpers may not be getting anything out of it as far as increased skills or increased inclusive fitness through the indirect route. It may just be that they do the behavior because they can't resist it. They hear begging young, and they turn into little robots. And finally, do helpers really help? In a lot of species, it has been shown that they can provide more or a greater consistent supply of food that reduces the starvation rate at a nest. They can sometimes reduce nest predation rates by helping to guard the nest and recruit individuals to mob potential predators. They may also reduce the stress on the parents to allow the parents to produce more nest or the parents to live longer, which again is a way that they can gain indirect fitness by helping the parents increase their reproductive capabilities. And finally, we talked about the fact that cooperative breeding is seen in some other groups like the subsocial insects.